Hello there, everybody. Welcome to another SoCal housing update. It's been four weeks, and it's interesting to take a look at all the numbers and see how things have totally evolved over the last four weeks. And now we're totally, uh, completely used to this robust market that we're in. Uh, I remember first doing these, and we were doing them, I think, on a weekly basis. And it was, uh, you know, daunting what the way the numbers look. But uh, I saw that there wasn't a lot, a lot of inventory and we weren't adding inventory and COVID-19 was not only suppressing demand, but it was also suppressing the supply. And uh, that got us through that roughest patch. The roughest of it was mid-April. Mid and then ever since then, this market has totally been improving. We'll go over all those un incredible numbers. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We'll let other people come on when they're able to come on. And yes, this will be recorded, um, I, I have been told. And let's go ahead and get this going. So uh, let's start off, of course, with some summer fun photos, like I always like to do. And here are the, the latest rendition of fun photos. If 2020 were a, was a car, if 2020 was a man bun. <laughs> Not so awesome, is it? How about if 2020 were a pinata? Don't knock unless I married you, birthed you, or ordered food from you. <laughs> Isn't that like the new normal? <laughs> Ding dong, knock, 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 go outside and there's, there's dinner. It's on your, it's on your uh, front, front uh, porch. But this was very interesting. Pinterest trying to explain the coronavirus to crafty people in a way they might understand. And my kids totally understood this too. If 10 people are crafting at a table and one of them is using glitter, can you guess how many projects now have glitter on them? Pretty much all of them. If they're not socially distancing their art. Just when you thought the summer of 2020 couldn't get any worse? <laughs> That'll teach you to fall asleep with while sitting in a chair holding a beer. At this point in 2020, I don't know if I should laugh or cry. Miami-Dade restaurants, gyms, closing to fight COVID surge. Florida, schools ordered to reopen in August. <laughs> Sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Wash your hands like you just cut habaneros and have to take your contacts out. I'd be careful. If you come into the store without a mask, we will have to take your temperature. Yes, we only have rectal thermometers. <laughs> my wife, my wife didn't like that joke as much. She thought it was cool. Please distance yourself at least six feet apart or the average length of a CVS receipt. Thank you. And this was actually CVS. We looked at it, CVS pharmacy. I think that's great. <laughs> now embrace who you are at CVS. So, uh, quantitative economic decision science is major from UC San Diego. For those, if any of you guys are new on this, um, uh, Orange County native, I've uh, been doing this for a long time, Cap Valley High School grad, nine kids, avid runner. Yes, I brought the six on the right. We were a Brady Bunch family. My wife brought the two on the left. We had them all the time. I adopted her, she adopted mine, and we had this bonus guy. He's doing absolutely spectacular in. Uh, We've been potty training him during this lockdown and, and uh, just, just being at home so often, and he's doing great. I've also been all over the press, and the, uh, our company is Reports on Housing. It's, uh, our slogan is your local real estate snapshot. It really is what's going on in the trenches of, of uh, the real estate market. And uh, most co closed sales data, we, and I'm going to even talk about closed sales data, but as far as closed sales data is concerned, it's like operating in the rear view mirror. You can't really drive a car looking backwards, right? So the bottom line is uh, it, what, what happened in April and May to bring about June's closed sales doesn't really matter as to what is going on right now today. So you can look backwards and say, okay, that's where we've been, but where are we right now today? And that is supply and demand. Supply, active listing inventory, telling you how many homes are in the market and are competing against each other, and demand, the last 30 days worth of pending sales. That's the velocity of pending sales, and that I refer to as demand. And uh, 
from those two, from supply and demand, we get the expected market time. If this is your home on the market today, when are you going to go into escrow? If you're a buyer, you're a seller, in different price ranges, attached versus detached, we have it all, and it really hones in on what the market is like for all of those different aspects, drilling it down to not only the county, but the city and area level as well. It's about setting expectations for everybody involved because everybody's expectations can be a little bit out of whack if you're just basing it upon uh, what, what you read and hear in the news. So uh, I have reports for the Los, Los Angeles, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego, and Orange County, LA, and San Diego all got the reports this week. And uh, the reports since the last time I did the, how, the, uh, this Southern California presentation, uh, a month ago, the, the, we did one on luxury returns, and we'll get into those stats. And then I also did one uh, that just came out this week, it's why do some homes sit? So, uh, and this is what, we have a brand new, we revealed a new uh, format for the overall house report. It's a cleaner, fresher look with better looking charts. As you can see, more streamlined. Uh, we, we have the cover piece and then below that is, is the main piece that we're talking about. And that's sitting on the market. I go over what's going on with, uh, even in, in the lower price ranges, it's between 25% and 35% of homes have been sitting on the market for over two months. So why is that if the market is so blasted hot in those ranges? And I, I, and I talk about uh, some of the pitfalls of sellers thinking on pricing as well as what goes into pricing and what goes in condition and uh, different attributes of the home, that type of thing. And then I have a section for active listings. And, uh, and these are what the new charts look like, by the way. So it's an upgrade. You'll see exactly uh, later on in this presentation as well. So I, I, I go over where we are active listings wise, what's been going on in the last couple of weeks, as well as where we were compared to last year. And then I go into demand and even demand, uh, I talk, do the same thing and talk about what's happened in the last two weeks, what, where, uh, where we've been, compared to last year. I also go over the expected market time. How long is it going to take to sell a, a home or overall of all of uh, the county? And then I talk about the luxury end as well. And the luxury end piece talks, talks specifically, now it's year over year data, what's been going on recently as well as what's been going on uh, compared to last year. And uh, then I break down each of the price ranges and, and, how, and how there's been any kind of a change going up or down as far as the expected market time, how long it takes to, to market your home from now to placing it into escrow. And then I have a housing summary. A lot of people like to use the summary. I have a link at the bottom of all of the reports and all in those links are, is the summary. And the, the summary can be posted on Facebook as well. Not the whole entire report, but the summary. And we also have an excerpt for it. And then you'll see, we updated our, our different charts like this as well. And this breaks down uh, the, the county by city. And for this particular one, this is San Diego County, I actually break down the city of San Diego into all the various areas besides just the big city of San Diego. Do the same thing for Los Angeles too, because LA, the city is so big, we break it down into areas as well, because they, they these different areas completely, they, they behave completely different. I also go break it down by attached versus detached, and then all homes price ranges so that you get to understand what's going on in the various price ranges. And then I have a closed sales report and it, it goes over uh, where we are compared to last year, as well as the list to sales price ratios, uh, the lowest price and the highest price in the area and all those good things. And then I also have a foreclosure and short, short sell uh, report, talk about the number of active uh, foreclosures and, and short sales in any community. And then I do it by price range and also talk about the county's highest shares. Uh, and then of course the lowest as well shares. And then I go over all of Southern California housing and have, uh, I, I do a little snapshot of what's going on in the various markets. So that's kind of a layover. I haven't done that before I did 
I did that in one of my uh, prior meetings. It's just so you know what the report looks like. And that same report is updated every two weeks. Everything is totally redone so that it's, so that it's all new and you have the latest data and all the latest charts. To subscribe, you go to reportsonhousing.com. That's R-E-P-O-R-T-S on housing.com. And there is a sample report section and a bunch of frequently asked questions as well. And uh, the, the we have, uh, like I said, at the, this is emailed to you. So if you sign up today, you get the most recent report and there's a PDF version for printing it out. There's a word version for copy, cut, edit, paste. And there's, uh, that's to make part of your own marketing print material. And I have Excel spreadsheets, uh, plenty of Excel spreadsheets and they're all updated as well with every report. I have an excerpt for social media, blogs, websites, and then there's lots of charts and the charts are all updated. There are over, there are typically, there's depends upon the market. Orange County have the most because I've gone for such a long time, but um, that I've kept them, but there, I have the most relevant one, which is about 20 charts in, in each of the, uh, in each of the counties. And it comes out every two weeks. I do it every Thursday. Uh, I do every other Thursday. And this Thursday, tomorrow, I'm crunching uh, San Bernardino and Riverside, and that will be next week's report. So uh, it's $15 per month or $150 per year. You sign up, you get a month free if you use the coupon code PEAKING. We'll talk about PEAKING momentarily. Uh, because it, it is an important subject to understand what's going on in the marketplace right now and when the best time to sell a home is and, and how it looks going out. And my housing debrief, I finished the last Tuesday housing debrief uh, yesterday. For now on, the housing debrief is just going to be once a week at 3 o'clock p.m. every Friday. And you go, you navigate to my personal page, which is at SoCal Stephen, and from my personal page, I will I make it uh, available to anybody, to the general public, and and uh, I've actually run out of friends. I have five thousand friends, so you don't need to to send me a friend request because I have no more room. But uh, more than happy to uh, to share the the copy of the presentation with all subscribers as well. Um, yeah, a PDF version. So we're going to talk about COVID-19. And the reason we're talking about COVID-19 is because it is worth talking about. Because people ask me, so Stephen, why do you focus on COVID-19? And the reason I do is because I don't want to see this happen, that W-shaped recovery. And it's very plausible that we could have this happen. And we're just going to have to see where we are in September, see how we've navigated. Now that we're in another lockdown here in California, what happens going out? What happens to, uh, to our thinking and the way that we respond this time as things opened up? Because I can tell you, based upon the numbers, we, the last reopening was a disaster because of the numbers spiking like they are right now. And, uh, and now I'm going to go over some numbers that I just find absolutely fascinating. And here it is. The, there are uh, 13,360,401 that is where uh, we are at. And we went from 8,200,000, that was four weeks ago, to that 13,360,000. So uh, you can see we add, we've been adding quite a few uh, cases in just four weeks. And we were averaging 133,000 new cases per day for the seven day average. That was four weeks ago. Now I'm showing you what it is today. And it's 213,400 per day. So you can see we're adding a lot more cases and this is just absolutely skyrocketing. We kind of plateaued and then about, because we're at the 190, uh, 190 mark at uh, about a month and a half ago, it looked like we were just plateauing, but that's just not nearly the case. And I don't know why I put this on here twice. Oh, this is, oh, this is the United States, US. The U.S. is at 3,432,000 cases. L.A., when I did this last time, was behind Cook County, uh, Illinois, as the most impacted county. It was the third most impacted county. But you can see what happened on the left. Cook County is at 96. L.A. is at 141,000. We blew past them in the last four weeks, which says a lot about what's going on in Illinois versus what's going on in California, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana again, and also uh, Georgia. So it's just the Sun Belt, Florida. 
So we thought that summer would take care of COVID-19 and it doesn't seem like it, it, it is doing anything with it. And as far as the United States is concerned, this was the chart four weeks ago. See, it looked like we were slowly but surely coming down, but we were starting to trail up four weeks ago and we were averaging 22,500 cases. This is the chart now for the United States. You could see big change. 22,500 cases, have, uh, for the, that was a seven day average. Now the seven day average is 62,200 cases. That's all the way on the right hand side. This chart is seven day moving average. Cause if you look at the daily average, it kind of seesaws all over the place. But when you do a seven day average, it makes it nice and smooth. And you can see what the trend line looks like. And this is the current trend where uh, it looks like we might be plateauing at the 60,000 uh, level. Uh, we're, we're, we'll just have to wait and see, but that, that seems to be uh, where we're at. But Fauci said he wouldn't be surprised. We continue to go down around down the pace and not taking care of things like lockdown California, we would have easily been moving our way towards 100,000. And uh, these are, this is from the University of Washington that's quoted all over the place, as well as from the, uh, the uh, White House. And this just goes to show you how important masks are, the daily infections and testing. If you look at this, you can see, I'm not really getting in that much into testing, I'll get into that in a moment, but this is the daily infections. The numbers have, have uh, been on the rise. And you can see where, where it's going right now is uh, if we masked, that's the green line, we'll go down to very few daily infections. Instead, the direct direction that we're gonna go is along that right line and it could go up if we, if we do not do the proper amount of easing. So, tells you how important masks are. And these are daily deaths, same thing. Looked like we were plateauing or we were, we were continuing to go down and everything was looking good, but now the, the death rate is going up and we're, we're marching our way towards 1,000 deaths per day again. Doesn't, it pales in comparison to when New York had a lot of people dying and we had 2,200 uh, uh, deaths per, per day there for a moment. But still, at 1,000 deaths per, per day, that's still a lot. You could see if you follow the green line, if we all masked up, you can see it's going to come down. And, we'll, and, and any questions and answers, go ahead and load them up in the Q&A section, and I'll be more than happy to answer them at the end. You can see the, the red line, if we, uh, if we just did nothing and we continued to ease, uh, we would watch the, the numbers continue to climb, especially once we got into the uh, winter months, or almost winter months, the fall. Uh, and this is uh, total deaths. This was at 209,000 just uh, a week and a half ago. They have changed it because of the spikes in coronavirus along the Sun Belt. And now the death rate has been put at 224,000 for, for projection by the time we get to November 1st. And this was the COVID-19 test results per day that I did four weeks ago. And uh, it looked like we want to be at five. We want to be really below five percent, and we were just getting there. We were just arriving at below five percent. That is all tests taken. We have five percent or less positives. What that means is once you get below five percent, you have an easier time doing contact tracing. When we first were doing this, we had like twenty-five percent, even higher than that. Tests were positive out of every. We were only testing people that we thought had it, and now because of the capacity issues in testing, even though we've done, uh, we, you can see this curve, this curve continues to go up as numbers of tests. We even hit 823,000 uh, uh, last week. You can see that we're still, we're having a big problem. And the, the problem is, and they talked about this before, we need to be doing a million tests per day. And that is to get the number adequately at 5% or below. And that's also putting on masks and doing, uh, doing uh, you know, social distancing and things like that. We're doing it a lot smarter, not, not uh, having big pool parties, not having massive family reunions, that type of thing. We were before had a positivity rate of about 5% or less uh, when, when I was doing it four weeks ago. And now it has been hovering between eight and 9%. So you can see that's kind of an issue. That means that we have too high of a positive rate. There's areas of Florida that have over a 20% positive rate, which means they are only testing once again, the people that they absolutely think have it because it's taking uh, you know, days upon days to get even the results back at this point. 
capacity issues. This is California. This was a month ago. Look like uh, it didn't look like we ever really plateaued and it continued to climb. And it really did continue to climb. Because if you look at that, we hadn't even hit uh, three. This is the seven day moving average of cases per day. We just eclipsed 3,000. Now look at where we're at. We're at 159, we were at 159,000 cases. We're at 346,000 cases in four weeks. We were at 3,189 for the last, for the seven day moving average four weeks ago. Now we're at 8,885 cases per day. You can see we're moving in the wrong direction, which is why uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, like him or don't like him, almost forced his, forced his hand to close this down. They're gonna to have to do something similar in Texas and Florida because it is just absolutely out of hand. Florida is even worse than California right now. And this is the cases. If you can see California County cases, uh, 75,000 in LA uh, four weeks ago at 140,000. Riverside County from 11,600 to 26,400. Orange County went from 9,000 to 26,100. Orange County is ac actually went from fourth in the most impacted county in California to third. San Diego was at 9,700, it's now at 20,900. And San Bernardino is going to pass San Diego also. They're at 7,800, now they're at 20,400. Their velocity increase is faster than San Diego, so they should surpass them in the next day or two. And then this is interesting. They, they've changed something along the state. And this is what is going on in the state. LA last uh, two weeks, the number of new cases is up 35%. Hospitalizations is up 12%. ICU availability is at 38%. This was at like 85% uh, about six weeks ago. And this is where it's at now. So you can see uh, ICU is climbing. And deaths is up 15%. Orange County in the last two weeks, new cases up 79%. Hospitals up 27%. ICU availability up 41% and deaths up 28%. So really uh, Orange County it, out of all of them is probably having the biggest uh, issue. And even in my own area, I, I live in Ladera Ranch. We only had like 18 uh, cases in Ladera Ranch. We're at like 90 now. And that was, that's all happened within the last four weeks or five week period actually. Riverside last two weeks, new cases up 46%, hospitals up 31%, ICU availability at 32% and deaths up 25%. This is the, the two weeks. San Bernardino, new cases up 61%, hospitals up 42%, ICU availability at 25% and deaths up 23%. And when they say ICU availability, there are some hospitals that are impacted where they have no ICU, so they have to actually move patients to other hospitals. And San Diego's uh, probably in the best uh, scenario out of anybody. New cases up 47%. Hospitalizations are actually down 7%. ICU availability is at 33% and deaths up 17%. So uh, out of all of them, San Diego is doing the best with their new case count. That's been the problem. And that's why they joined everybody else in the lockdown and the more intense lockdown that was announced on Monday. So let's talk about macroeconomic outlook. And I talk about a lot of charts before the coronavirus, everything was absolutely humming on all cylinders. Everything looked spectacular. And then we have after the disease, everything looked absolutely dismal where it was either a waterfall or a spike. And that meant not good. However, we are starting to see come out of things and down the road, we'll talk about America's back. We call that AB, but we're not even close. We're only there in uh, the industry of real estate right now. And uh, financial markets of Wall Street are, are back, but that the overall economy is not doing so well. And people say, say, Stephen, why are you tracking so closely the economy? And that's because, you know what, the uh, over, overall what goes on in the national economy affects everything, housing market demand evictions, everything else. There's a lot of turmoil that, that's out there. So it all trickles down. I like this uh, as a Forbes article, a national mask mandate could save the US economy $1 trillion, Goldman Sachs says. And what this means is that if we just are mindful about this virus and we do the right thing, the bottom line is our economy will roar back at a better rate than if we did nothing. And then we have these outbreaks all over the place. And then we just continuously have to either shut down or people will shut down on their own and won't do as much uh, because of the fear of spread. And so I too have masks. I don't I not only have one mask, I have like four masks now at this point. 
I think that uh, there are plenty of fun masks that, that you can get out there. And I had one personally designed for reports on housing. The uh, unemployment rate comes out on Thursdays. So this is Wednesday. We don't have the latest one. This was last week's at 1.31 million. You can see if you go backwards in time, that is ridiculously high, even at 1.31 million. That's what happens when you do a forced shutdown of the economy like we've never done before, totally unprecedented. The continuing claims for unemployment insurance are at 18.1 million. That's where that was the most recent week, they said, June 27. And then this is a St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index is at uh, positive 0 0.1558. No, you need to be below zero. When I did this four weeks ago, it was below zero, but because of the outbreak, it went above zero. It's not anything like where it was when we first locked this down. And this is all a bunch of financial instruments that everything that's taken a look at, and it's all put into one index. And that one index uh, was, was, of course, when we first went into this, it was way off. Now it went down to where it was almost making its way towards normal. And then we had this recent outbreak. So we'll have to see where it goes. And this is forbearance. We all know a lot of people that have gone into forbearance or, or know of forbearance. It actually dropped from 8.39% to 8.18%. It's the second drop in a row uh, week to week. And that's, that's good news. Uh, it means that it's 8% of all mortgages have, have, are uh, doing a forbearance. There are people that are coming out of forbearance most of them are not doing a payment plan. They're negotiating out, delaying that thing to the very end of the loan, which means that if you have anybody that is thinking of listing, you need to ask them if they were ever in forbearance. And then if they answer yes, and they say, and you ask them, so did you do a payment plan or delay? They did a payment plan, ask them if they paid it off. If they didn't, that needs to be paid. If they delayed it and put it at the end, let's say they owed 500,000, yet they have $15,000 in deferred payments. On the net sheet is 500,000 plus the 15,000. So when they do a demand at the bank, they're gonna get a demand for 515,000. It'll be, it'll be more coming off of that net sheet than they originally had thought if they didn't think of the ramifications. They don't get a freebie. Those delayed payments are delayed, they're deferred for another day and they need to come off of, uh, off of the net sheet. And this is the uh, purchase application index done by the MBA. Uh, and uh, you can see this is where it's at right now. Year over year, it's up 16%. That is seven straight weeks where year over year, the number of purchase applications exceeded the prior year. So. Uh, 2020 right now that was uh, that was about when i started to see the difference in demand it was the same time we started to see the purchase application index uh go positive year over year so bottom line with the economy we need to play our cards right wear our masks do our social distancing do everything that we're supposed to do don't be dumb about this people are saying oh, my kids should go back to school i've had people that don't have kids tell me i should put my kids back to school i'm not putting my kids in school full time with no social distancing and no masks while we're in the midst of a giant spike. Uh, because everybody's comparing it to other countries, they can compare it all they want to other countries, but they're not gonna compare it to the giant spike that we're going through right now because no one has the data on that. And I don't want children to be guinea pigs. So that's my own take on it. It's not political. It's just that I have so many kids. I'm very uh, mindful of what can happen. So, Biggest thing, we got to play our cards right so that we don't get that COVID-19 second wave that is ugly and it puts our uh, economy into a W-shaped recovery. So we are starting to come out and we're recovering. We just don't want to see it come back down and then come back up again because that'll be devastating for the economy to do that again. So let's talk about the SoCal housing market. The overall market, it's not just a spring market, but it's a hot, hot spring market. And um, if you look at it, this is where we are. These are the new charts. This is how I knew I did, did something wrong and I saw the old charts. You saw the old charts. These are the new updated looking charts. This is where we are right now. This is 2020. This is the active listing inventory. Since we last met a month ago, we were coming down, but we came down even further. The, dis the difference between last year and this year is growing. And that's because typically our active listing inventory is actually growing during this time of year. July 9th, that was last Thursday, we were at 27,102. That was down 4% in two weeks. 
Last year, we were at 40,932. That was up 62% compared to where we are today. This is the difference between last year and this year, the purple line versus the light green or uh, avocado color line. And then today, we're at 26,807. We're down 1%. You can see it's continuing to trend down when uh, this is not typically when it happens. It typically happens at the very end of July, mid-August is when we hit a uh, peak and then we come down. It's the lowest level right now, the lowest level of homes on the market since May of 2013. And if you think back to 2013, that was that ugly year where there was not enough homes on the market. That is exactly what we're experiencing right now today. COVID-19 is still suppressing supply just not as much. If you look at this, the number of new for sale signs in the past four weeks, so I did this last Thursday and looked at the prior four weeks and I compared it to the five-year average. So I looked at the number of homes coming on for a month and then I looked at it over that same time period for five years and, and the average. Southern California, is it, it's 14% fewer homeowners place their homes on the market compared to that five-year average. And you're thinking, wow, well, it's off. Well, it was off a lot more before. It was almost 50% off in, uh, in, in the middle of April. That's how far we have come. So we've come up from where COVID-19 was absolutely suppressing demand to the point where it's suppressing, and I mean uh, the inventory, it's suppressing inventory, to the point right now where it's suppressing inventory, its grip is loosening and we're getting back towards normal levels of homes coming on the market. Luxury, on the other hand, actually has 31% more homes compared to the last five-year average. Part of this is because homes have appreciated a lot in the last five years, but even if I look at it year over year, it is still up versus last year, just not up 31% overall. So, attention homeowners, you are running out of time to cash in on the best time of the year to sell. The best time of the year to sell is right now because we're gonna see that the homes uh, continue to fall, but just not at the same pace that they were before as far as the listing inventory. And the water is great, come in, this is the time to be placing your home on the market. This is like the best time of the spring market. And the spring market is going to come to an ab abrupt end because demand is peaking right now. We're at a, a peak for demand. So Southern California housing demand has absolutely skyrocketed upward. No mistake, it came from just an absolute pit to where it is today, and it's really strong. But COVID-19 is not suppressing demand at all. Uh, not, not one iota at this point. And a lot of that has to do with mortgage interest rates and where they're at right now. This is last Thursday's mortgage interest rate survey done by Freddie Mac, and they, they, do, they have been doing this, I think, since 1971. And it is the lowest level of all time at three, pretty much 3%. We had three weeks in a row of three record low rates. We just hit another one. It'll be interesting to see where we are uh, come uh, tomorrow. But I, I, I see that it'll probably stay right around where it's at right now. But we'll have to we'll 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 have to just wait and see what happens with those numbers. And those low rates are absolutely the rocket fuel that is propelling us forward, and it's creating so much demand for homes that come on the market that are in you know good shape, priced right. Because there are still homes that are sitting on the market that are in the hottest ranges that aren't selling. And there are real reasons for what, what it, uh, the, that, that go into why that might be. Some of it might be age, some of it condition, some of it are upgrades and amenities and location and those type of things. I talk about all that in the latest report. So this is where Southern California demand is. And this is what I talked about prior to it even doing this. I talked about how it's gonna level off as far as demand is concerned, and that is exactly what has occurred. You can see that demand, after totally ripping up, hit a, hit a really incredible record high, but then after that, it has done, it has kind of gone just a little bit higher, not much at all. So on July 9th, last Thursday, we were at 20,327. That was up 1% in two weeks. Different than what we were seeing before. We were seeing like, 40% up and 28% up. Now it's up 1% in two weeks. Last year, we were at 26, I mean, 16,119. That is the purple line. That's the difference between this year and last year. You can see we're outpacing demand for years. 
And today we're at 20,416, up 0.4%, so kind of flat one. And it's the highest level since 2012 when, it, when uh, it, the last time we saw the, the, the demand readings this high. But those were artificially high demand readings because embedded in those were a lot of short sales that never closed. Instead, we have a, a, a higher closing rate than what we had during the short sale days, if you remember back to that. And this is where we typically peak as far as demand is concerned. So peak occurs for listings between the uh, end of July and August, yet the peak in demand typically occurs between the months of April and May. There's this 30 day window that the peaks typically happen with, uh, from year to year. It just depends upon uh, different variables and the different velocity, but that's where that during that 30 day period, we see a peak in the number of escrows. Instead, where we're seeing that peak, you can almost shift this thing completely over and we're getting the peak in July instead. So we are uh, realizing a spring market, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay as hot as it is right now. Instead, we're gonna start to see demand come down a little bit. We've already seen it a little bit in San Diego because San Diego is one of the hottest markets early on. And now they're starting to come down uh, as far as demand is concerned, a little bit. And the rest of Southern California is going to join them. And then kids will go back to school. Kids will go back to school. There's blended school options for right now that might change depending upon COVID-19 numbers and stuff like that. And they're gonna have social distancing and masks and all that stuff, that's locally. And you have, my kids are gonna to go to school two days a week, uh, one week and then three days a week. They only go for half days and then the rest of it is online. So uh, that's kind of how they're doing it. They're doing it limited class size. And it's going to, so what's gonna happen when the kids go back to school, we're gonna be reaching at the end of August start of September, we're going to see demand go down again, and then it's going to re-engage with other years. And what? Ha why does that happen? It's just not the most apropos time for, for people to sell. Now, if you look at this, if you look at the red line, that red line actually had a little bit of a spike in October. The purple line last year, we had a tiny spike. What that is, is what I refer to as an October housing fest. We don't get it every year. We did not get it in 2018. And uh, I don't believe that we got it in 2016 either. So it just depends upon the year. But there are some years where collectively as, as a society, we decide, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, uh, purchase a home and we get this uptick in demand. And that is because people still can, buyers still can close on a home in the month of December. And th the reason for that, and families, it has everything to do with families. Kids go back to school, but if you purchase something in October and it closes in December, that is half time for kids schooling. They have a break between uh, two and three weeks where you can actually make that move and then they can start a new school if they need to, or it won't be as disruptive even if you move locally so that you can move into your new house and it's not disruptive and you start the next semester. There are people that can move and start a new school and it's not that disruptive because they're starting during the second semester. So you can see why there is a blip of activity sometimes in October, which manifests in higher closings in the month of December. And many people say, I have the best December always. That's because of this blip, the October housing fest that I'm talking about. And you can see demand is going to trail down. We are hitting a peak right now. So you show this chart to all of your uh, homeowners and, and potential sellers and sellers to show them they're running out of time. They've got to be priced right. This latest one that I came up with talks about sitting on the market. They need to understand what that means to them. And, and uh, they might, they might uh, leave behind a spring market and move into fall. We're not really going to ever have a summer market. We've moved our spring forward and now summer, we're going to start to see uh, demand dissipate and the number of homes coming on the market dissipate as well. This is the expected market time. It's the inverse of demand. When demand is skyrocketing, expect a market time drops like a rock. And this is, you place your home on the market today, when you're gonna go to escrow, and you can see I have a key at the top where it's a deep buyer's market all the way to a hot seller's market. Below 60 is a hot seller's market. You can see we're well below 60. We're at that 40 level. July 9th, it was at 40 days. That was down two in two weeks. So you can see that it too was diving and then it didn't and it went down a little bit not as much that's because demand went up a little bit not as much so uh 
it does the inverse of what, uh, what demand does. And you can see July 9th at 40 days, SoCal last year's, that purple line was at 82 day expected market time. That was barely a seller's market. It was what I refer to as a slight seller's market. It's the lowest level at 40 days since tracking. And if I take today's inventory and today's demand, it's actually at 39 days, so it's down one. So not only is it the lowest level since I started tracking this in 2012, but we just went lower uh, as of today's uh, numbers. And I do this again a week from tomorrow for all of Southern California. And so this is the expected market time. Where are we going to go from here? It's going to slowly elevate, kind of like that red line uh, shows you, that was 2017. So we are really hot, and now it's gonna start to continue to go up and it will feel a little bit uh, slower. That doesn't mean that your buyers can all of a sudden get a break because we're still under that 60 day threshold. However, we get towards the end of the end of the year and we get into the holidays and uh, that's when we get an increase in the expected market time. Things don't move as fast and we'll, we'll get above 60 days into a slight seller's market. This is most likely the direction that we're going to go. So as far as uh, the rest of Southern California, all Southern California is concerned. LA County is at 49 day expected market time. That's up one since last Thursday. Orange County is at 45 days, down one. Riverside County is at 32 days, down one day. San Bernardino County is at 29 days, down one day. And San Diego County is at 38 days, down two days. So uh, you can see Riverside is hot, San Bernardino is hot. Anything uh, at the, in the 30s is just extremely sizzling hot and, and in the 20s is ridiculous. And people in San Bernardino can vouch for that. So this all has to do with supply and demand. I'll go backwards. So we have very, very uh, high demand and we have a very, very low supply. That favors uh, sellers, and that's why we're getting rises in, in uh, pricing, regardless of what's being forecasted in the media. You know what's going on in boots in the street because of, uh, of all the issues that we're having with your buyers not being able to locate a property and be the winning bidder, and we're having appraisal issues. We always have appraisal issues when we're in an appreciating market. So, and especially a swift appreciating market. The market overview, this is Southern California closed sales. This is where we are at. You can see not as bad as May, June is, is uh, off compared to la the, the last few years, but it's not as bad as where we were in May. And July is going to be pretty much neck and neck with the rest. It could even in, in exceed where we were in uh, for the last few years. And that's just based upon the total number of homes that are in escrow right now, not just demand, but total escrows. June 2020, we're at 14,800. That's up 51% over May. That's, uh, that's pretty huge. You can see that's a big increase over May. So uh, year over year, June is down 15% compared to last year. Year over year, May was down 48% compared to the prior year. So you can see year over year is diminishing. I believe in July, this will go away. It will be a moot point. And we will have bypassed the first wave of COVID-19. And how we deal with the virus going forward is how these numbers will reflect down the road. Year over year, April was at down 31%. So you can see it went from 31 to 48, because that was the worst of it. May was reflection of April. And uh, year over year, June, down 15%. And LA County is down 25% year over year, and uh, it's up 49% month over month. Orange County is down 20% year over year and is up 56% month over month. Riverside County is down 7% year over year and is up 67% month over month. San Bernardino down 7% year over year, up 43% month over month. And San Diego, they're actually up 4% year over year. So this is why I'm telling you their demand's coming down because they've already, they, they already exceeded last year's numbers and they're, they're up 58% month over month. And uh, if you look at luxury, I did a big analysis on luxury and this report was two back. And this is the return of luxury. It's not only a return, it beat my expectations. It beat most everybody's expectations and is actually kicking behind right now. And this is LA County. You can see, uh, I did this in June. I'm not gonna update this because it's, it's too extensive for me to have to update like this, but 
you could, and they haven't changed that much, much in a two week period. But you can see overall today on the right hand side at 138 days, the prior best in March was 155 days. COVID-19 height was at 469 days. And, and, and for LA County, it's 1.5 million plus, by the way. Last year's height, 182 days. And I even did last year at, at that time, but 182 days versus 138, it's hot. Orange County, same, same thing, 111 days versus the prior height this year of 121. It slowed down to 322 days. And the prior height for last year was 161 days or uh, the, the best market for luxury was 161 days. And then you have uh, Riverside, this is 650 plus. Orange County is at 1.25 million plus. Riverside is the top 10% of the market thereabouts. In Riverside County, you're at 72 day expected market time uh, versus the prior best 166. It's low point was at 453 days. That's, that is off the charts. And then the best in 2019 was at 234 days. And San Bernardino is at 85 days. Best prior at 121 days was slowed down to 284 days during COVID-19. And the best last year was 158. And then you have San Diego at 107 days versus 118 prior best. And then 316 was the slowest point during COVID. And, and the best was 166 last year. So you can see luxury is pumping on all cylinders. A lot of that has to do with how hot the lower, the lower ranges uh, got, and a lot of it also has to do with low rates. Low rates, uh, you're, you're, you're wondering how uh, these people in the ultra wealthy ranges can get rate, good rates. Well, they sometimes when they have a lot of money with the bank, they get very, very favorable rates, and they're cashing in on those awesome rates. So you go to reports on housing.com. It's R-E-P-O-R-T-S on housing.com. You click on subscribe. It's $15 per month or $150 per year. You get a month free. If you sign up using the coupon code peaking, because that's what demand's doing right now, peaking. And uh, you can see a sample reports. And I do have my Facebook Live housing debrief at SoCal Steven. This Friday, 3 p.m. It says every Tuesday and Friday. Forgot to update this. It's no longer Tuesdays. I got updated on both sides of my presentation. I do have a Facebook business page. That's not where the debriefs are. They're on my personal page, SoCal Steven, but I do have a business page with a lot of content, a lot that you can share and bring folks to. It's reports on housing and YouTube channel reports on housing. I also have my debriefs hosted there as well. If you need content to get to your knucklehead buyers and sellers that don't get it, just send them to youtube.com so they can understand what's going on in SoCal right now. So now I can open it up to Q&A and uh, let's see, we have some questions. Any concerns about data and targeting for some, some of those countries? Uh, this is from Brian. I think this was when I was talking about, yeah, you know, there, there is some data in, in integrity, but I'm not, uh, in, if you're talking about, uh, the the COVID-19, there is some, but not that that much. There are some in like areas like uh, China, we, we understand that there might be some issues with the way they were reporting before, so can you figure it out? I don't know. So, but uh, by and large, most of these countries are really, uh, that you can tell by their, their death rate, you can tell by their overall death rate, any changes compared to prior years. Um, if there is a blip where it continues to increase compared to last year, uh, prior years, and yet they're yet uh, they're not telling you that they have COVID-19 uh, cases, well, then you can tell that there's that they probably still have COVID-19. But that's not the case that we're seeing in a lot of them. There are some countries that have it like right on the money. Uh, Iceland's one of them that is has probably done the best job. Uh, South Korea is another one that has done an incredible job. Germany is doing an incredible job as well. So I've looked at a lot of the data integrity. Um, I'm wondering about some data integrity that we have here in the United States. Uh, there, there was somebody that was fired in one of the, uh, in, in the various health offices because they wouldn't fudge the numbers. So uh, you, you, you always worry a little bit about data integrity and that is part of the error quotient that's out there. But we have to do our best educated 
jobs of figuring out what, what needs to be done based upon all hospitalizations. We can look at local hospitals and what's going on and, and try to figure out what, what we need to do based upon spread and people dying and people getting really hurt. And people, now there are more people, we all know of people that have been impacted by it. If you don't, just ask around. Um, it's, it's real. I know doctors, I know nurses. They, they tell me about the brutal side that they're dealing with. And I've also known people that have gone through it that it's brutal as well. So, uh, and that's all. I'm just following data and stats for it as best as I possibly can. I've actually gotten rid of some places that I don't find their data very, very good. So there is a data integrity issue, but I found others that are absolutely incredible that I, that I uh, stumble upon. And the longer we go on, the, the, the more uh, places we have for data. So keep on, if there are any other questions, please ask them. But somebody asked, what is easing? And uh, easing is easing our abilities to uh, do, to go back to normal. And, um, and when we stop wearing masks, when we start going to the gym, when we start having parties in our backyard, when we all go to the beach, uh, we're not doing social distancing. Those are easing of restrictions that are out there. We have a mask ordinance in the state of California and yet you can still go around and some people are pounding their fists saying, you can't make me do it, I can't breathe. There've been people that have put on masks for a long time and had an oxygen thing on their finger and have done normal things around the house, that type of thing. And they're not seeing any effect on their oxygen intake. So I think some of that might be psychological. I understand I have some kids that's, uh, that plays into whether you go all online or they go back to school or you do a mix is how they're able to handle a mask and there's better masks coming out and all that stuff. So uh, you, we just have to be mindful of the virus because it will trickle down to the economy, which will trickle down to house. Um, how do you see the upcoming elections affecting the market, if at all? Uh, my data goes back since 2004 for all of Orange County, since 2012 for uh, the Southern California. And I can't find a correlation between the housing numbers and, and uh, elections. I can, you can see it as far as short term in, uh, in Wall Street but you'll be hard pressed to find any data on it in real estate. That's just a storyline, not backed up by data. If somebody finds somebody that has data on it, please send it my direction. In all these years, I've been asked that over and over again, come every election, and I've never seen it. So what is your 2021 outlook? Too soon for me to, tell, to, to say, I have to get all the way to September for me to feel more comfortable about talking about it. And that's when I come up with my 2021 outlook. It really depends upon how mindful we are about this virus and what the numbers look like in, in September. We can't really, uh, right now it's all up in the air. We just did another lockdown. We don't know what the implications are. We don't know where uh, unemployment, uh, if it's gonna get much better. Uh, there's a lot that, there's a lot of road that happens from day to day and week to week in this environment. And September from where we are right now, and I do it typically mid-September is what, two months away? That's about nine weeks from now uh, to get to mid-September. And that's a lot of runway. I wanna see all that runway so that I have a lot of COVID numbers and a lot of tracking to see where we're at. So uh, overall, as far as housing is concerned, I don't see a big spike in inventory. People have been comparing our market. Somebody compared it in a post to 2005. It's just, you can't compare prior to the Great Recession to today because housing led that recession. This is a epidemic, a pandemic globally that has affected our, our economy and we did it for shutdown. This is totally different. Housing is a lot stronger. We have an inventory that is at, at an extremely low level and we're very, very hot. It would be very, very hard for us to reverse courses and all of a sudden have a buyer's market. If people talk about distress, will there be distress? There will be, just not waves of distress. It will be a lot smaller than what we've, than what people are anticipating. There will be more, but we'll be going from like 50 in a, in, in a county to 120 in a county total on the market. So you won't really notice it. There will be more, just not that much. It'll actually be compared to about, I'd say three-year-old levels. 
and three years ago in 2017, it didn't look bad and it was not the story. So there are gonna be changes. I'll be talking about that uh, going forward as far as my outlook for 2021, but I still see strong demand led by really incredible interest rates and also the demographics of the 30 year olds, the, the start third of their 30s. It is the biggest uh, patch of, of uh, it's, it's the biggest wave of demographically aged people that can, can, that can purchase to come and it's exceeding the baby boomers that is coming online right now. So that's actually good for 2020 through 2024. And so you have that in the mix of things as well. Will you expect the number of foreclosures and short sales increase since the unemployment number is still very high? Uh, unemployment, it affects a lot of different ranges, but it really impacts the lower ranges, which does not affect the number of foreclosures and short sales as much as people would think. And you have to understand as far as uh, the most likely to be foreclosed on are those people that put little down payments. And there are some that did that. It's just not that many. And it would have to be the people that lost their job and purchased in the second half of 2018, all of 2019 to, uh, to, this, to the first part of 2020. If they put 5% down or less, uh, yes, the market's done better, but they still have to play, pay closing costs. Those are the people that are most vulnerable and they'd have to have lost their job. Those are the people that are most vulnerable to becoming distressed. It's not a wave. It's not like before when we came down 40% or 30% in value, and now you have a lot of people underwater. Instead, we have the opposite. We have a market that's continuing to improve, not dive. So it will be a small patch of people that, that will that, that will uh, bear the brunt of the distressed. So will the election shift the direction of the housing market? I think I answered that. And I said, no. So anybody else have a question? Uh, let's see, so we're right at 11 o'clock. It's been an hour. I appreciate everybody joining us. Go to reportsonhousing.com, enter in peaking, and that is the, that'll get you unlock a, a free month. And uh, everybody have a beautiful day. Enjoy your Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us.